As fear increases, it's beneficial. The adrenaline levels rise, you become sharp, you become clear, you become focused, and you can actually use that in a positive way. And throughout my career, it's been a process of learning to live with fear and understand it and use it to help you. Looking back now, we had what was probably the closest near miss in the ISS's history. I think the words you used were, it would have been catastrophic. Yes, yeah. I mean, we were quite fortunate that we had had a flawless mission up until that point. The launch went really well. The whole day of launch with all the preparation was really well. The rendezvous had gone well. Um, and so we were in the final stretches coming towards the space station after a six-hour uh, rendezvous process. And uh, the Soyuz has an automated system, so it was doing its own thing. We were just monitoring it. Um, when you say Soyuz, that's the spacecraft? That's the spacecraft, okay. yeah, the Soyuz spacecraft. So we were fully expecting it to dock itself. Um, everything was working normally. And we were 17 metres from the ISS, and, and that's uh, the closest that any spacecraft has been when it's had a, a problem. Normally, when you're inside 50 metres, there's nothing really much that will go wrong. So we were not expecting anything to go wrong, and, and at 17 metres to go master alarm went off um, and we had had a master alarm going off a, a few times during the rendezvous process but it was for a very trivial condensation problem and that's what our spacecraft told us it was again it's a condensation problem so uh, we thought hang on you know th this feels a bit more serious we could feel the spacecraft had stopped its approach and it was backing out into space um, and we started to dig down into the emergency procedures and we'd had one of our thrusters had failed so Yuri our commander at the time had to take manual control of the spacecraft um, uh, and he was going to have to manually dock us at that point um, which is a process that has happened before and we do train for uh, but it is a reasonably uh, serious situation a manual docking it requires a high degree of skill in order to do it um, and so immediately at that point your training just kicks in um, and it felt like we were back in the simulator again running through an exercise at that point, you just have to focus as a crew, you have to run through the procedures, um, and we were just doing everything we could to make sure that this docking was going to go okay. And the sun angle was very, very poor, so lighting conditions were poor. We were going from daylight to darkness, making it very, very difficult. We were very tight next to another cargo vehicle, so a very small margin of error, and the solar panels would have, would have collided. Um, and then we had a, a further failure inside the spacecraft. So now we're in a situation where we've got multiple failures stacking up, and Tim Coper and myself couldn't do much at this point to help Yuri out. Um, and uh, it was one of those situations where you can feel things just starting to spiral out of control. Um, and I think that's the key uh, where training and experience comes in. That's the point at where um, accidents will happen if you, you know, with a junior crew. Um, Yuri was very experienced on his sixth mission, mission to space. Uh, Tim and I were both test pilots. And we just could feel this situation was starting to tick all the boxes that was going to lead up to a catastrophe. Yeah. Do you remember actually how it felt in that moment? Because several hours before that, you had kissed your wife and kids goodbye. Did your training just kick in or was there a little bit of fear initially? Oh, well, well, there is fear, but I think fear is good. And, and throughout my career, I think it's been a process of, of learning to live with fear and understand it and use it to help you. Um, there's kind of a, a fear curve uh, where, you know, as fear increases, it's, it's beneficial. The adrenaline levels start to rise. You become sharp, you become clear, you become focused, and you can actually use that in a positive way, um, along with your training and experience to deal with the situation. Then you get to the point where fear increases, increases further. And then it starts to be a negative process where it starts to inhibit your thinking and your clarity of thought and your focus. And, and that's when, you know, you've, you've really gone too far and where fear gets out of control. What we do is we train a lot um, so that we can manage our fear. We can manage it and use it to help us in a situation. As a test pilot, that happened on several occasions when uh, we had perhaps a fire or an engine failure or thing, you know, problems were, were going out of control. And, and, and it, I, you know, throughout my life, I've kind of been able to play with that and, and manage it and understand myself as to when, you know, when I'm getting to the point that I really need to start worrying. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. 
Because I think one of the things that we think about when we think about people like yourself who have been to space and are astronauts is, you know, how do you deal with fear? How do you deal with stress? How do you keep your cool in potentially very challenging and life-threatening situations? Because I think, although what you're doing is potentially very different in many ways from what I might do or a mother might do or a father might do in their day-to-day lives, presumably the principles are actually the same. A little bit of stress can help us. Too much stress starts to become damaging. Yes, absolutely. Um, And you're absolutely right. And I, I think it's, to me, in that situation, for example, in the spacecraft, it was a case of, right, what can I do now? Let, let's start running through the procedures. Let's stay on top of the problem. Let's start getting ahead of the game. Um, you always want to be ahead of the situation. So whilst Yuri was focused on flying the spacecraft um, and there was little I could do to help, I was thinking about the fuel, about the life support systems, because I knew the next step was if this you know, takes a long time, we're burning up precious fuel, uh, that could be a problem. And so I can be the one who's already got the calculations done. I can be keeping an eye on the clock. Um, and, and Tim Copra was was similarly keeping an yeah. eye on the engine systems. And we just knew what each other was were doing. And we're working through this problem. And I think it's a case of having options. Uh, uh, yeah. And the fear really kicks in when you start to run out of options. That's true fear, because now you don't know what to do. And now you're reacting rather than being proactive. It sounds very much like the Stoic philosophy, control what you can control. Absolutely. Is that something you you think is important for you, your team, your crew, and I guess for all of us? Completely. I mean, with the rocket launch um, as well, you could have a catastrophic failure. We know there is a risk of that, and we understand uh, what approximately what the odds are, what the risk is. What are the odds? Um, it's about, uh, for any rocket launch, it's about 10%, but that's not uh, on the human-rated launches. We have a lower percentage than that. So it's about a 1 in 120 uh, are the odds of having a catastrophic problem. Now, I just want to pause you there because as a doctor, we're often talking to patients about risk of certain procedures. Uh, Surgeons will do this all the time. You know, they'll say, you know, the benefits of this surgery are X, Y, and Z. Mm. uh, But the, I I need to make sure you're aware of the risks. You know, there's a one in a hundred chance of this, a one in a thousand chance of this. And, you know, these are really rare, one in 10,000 or one in a hundred thousand. To me, and to what I'm used to talking about, one in 120 sounds like quite a common thing. That, to me, that is something that really could happen. But you're still doing that. I mean, is your perception the same? This one in 120 sound, well, that means 119 times I'm going to be fine. That's, that's, a, that's a good hand to be playing. What, how do you perceive that? Um, I, I don't look at it from a statistical point of view uh, really, I what I've look at are the incidents that have happened, and I try and assess the risk. So, so we know that you know we we had an Apollo one fire killed three crew. We've had the Challenger and the Columbia incidents, fourteen crew members killed. We had a, a, a Russian incident, three crew members killed. You look at the incidents. You look at why they happen, how they happen, what we've done to mitigate them. And I prefer to analyze the technical aspects and think, okay. Um, how have we addressed those problems and how is it now a safer environment and what are the potential problems that could happen and how would we deal with that? So, uh, and that gives me, I think, a better understanding of the real risk that I'm taking. There is obviously a a potential that something breaks that nobody has yet noticed or a problem that hasn't yet occurred. Um, But that comes into the area of you can't control that. And that's what we put to one side. And I think it's exactly that situation you said. You control, um, you know, what you you can control. You have a plan to do something about it. And those elements that you can't control, don't let them overtake you. And then at the end of the day, you have to decide if you're prepared to take that risk or not. That approach, is that something you've learned through your life? I'm sure many of those aspects you have trained at and got better at, but was it also innate to you, do you think? Um, I think that I, as a youngster, I was somebody who embraced adventure, definitely. And I was happy to push myself out of my comfort zone. And 
I think my years of flying a helicopter have always made me expect the unexpected. Right. Um, I know there's a joke that, that you know, an aircraft, a plane will want to fly itself. It's got wings, it will naturally glide. Uh, you do nothing to it and it will want to stay in the air, whereas a helicopter is thrashing itself to bits and if something goes wrong, it will want to just you know take itself out of the sky. So as a helicopter pilot, you're constantly looking at the next field to land in, where to put it down if there's a problem. And, and that it just ingrains in you this expectation of something is going to go wrong. And, and I think I, I carry that with me when I'm on a mission. And also we get into that mindset uh, as astronauts because you never allow your guard to drop completely. Even when you're on the space station, you're four months into your mission, it's a routine Saturday morning, you're just having a cup of tea, bacon sandwich. There's a part of you that knows that the space station could get hit by a space, piece of space debris at any point and you have to click into your emergency procedures. So you never really let your guard down. Is that stressful? There is, yes, it, it, there is an underlying element of stress there and um, I think that it would be unhealthy to live with that for a long, long period of time. Having said that, we've had a, a two crew members when I was on board, uh, Scott Kelly, Misha Kornienko, were spending a year living in space. Um, and in fact, Scott was fantastic to work with as my first ISS commander because um, you know, learning from him and his experiences and how he dealt with that stress, how he managed to relax, but also um, you know, he, he made sure that we had sufficient rest that we could always have that extra 10% in the bag for when an emergency was going to happen. That's fascinating for me, Tim, because I imagine, and I want to talk about the recruitment process at some point, but I'm guessing that you were already very, very good at uh, dealing with stress, managing it, you know, dealing with fear, yet you still said it was great to have this commander because you could learn from him. So therefore, my question is, is getting better at stress, is resilience, in your view, a trainable skill? Completely trainable. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, we, that's exactly what we do for several years before our first mission. We are essentially um, put into environments where we're building up our resilience. We're learning how to deal with stress. Um, when we're training down in a cave, for example, we'll spend seven or eight nights um, in a caving complex in Sardinia. And it, they're very technical caves. It takes about a day and a half just to get to the base camp. And then we're exploring on from there. There's real risk involved. Yeah. Um, if you have an injury, it's going to be exceptionally hard to um, you know, extract somebody with a broken limb, for example. We'll spend 12 days living underwater in an Aquarius habitat 30 meters down. So you're completely satisfied saturated with nitrogen, there is no option to come to the surface other rapidly, otherwise you'll just suffer decompression sickness. So we're put into environments where there's real risk and there are real consequences. And that is so that we can build resilience. We're, we're learning not just the soft skills of learning how to get on with our crewmates, but we're learning for ourselves how we can deal with that pressure. What does the word resilience mean to you? Well, I think resilience is... Um, it's a case of ex ex exploring, you know, pushing your boundaries. It's a case of doing something that you haven't done before so that you learn something from yeah. that experience. And then you have, uh, it, it's an armory, isn't it? You've got, a, you've got a toolbox that you go through life with and it's about putting tools into your toolbox. Yeah. And the more different things you try, the more you learn about yourself, then the more tools you're putting in your toolbox to be able to deal with situations that might come up in the future. So given that these skills are trainable, what advice would you give to someone who has no desire to be an astronaut, who just wants to be better at managing stress in their day-to-day -day life? Um, I think the advice is to try and um, have some time to, to think and reflect. So you first, that's the first thing. You, you, you know, you, it's very, very difficult to um, even understand the problem or deal with it when you're in a very busy situation. So if you can mm. just carve yourself five, ten minutes somewhere in the day to go and have some peace and quiet and then to think and think about what is it in your life that is causing you the stress? Why are you worried about something and analysing the problem? I've always approached things from a, a technical point of view. That's the, the military, that's the test pilot in me. But it's a case of an, analysing why am I afraid of this situation? Why is it causing me stress? And what can I do about it? And then start 
writing things down. I, I find that if I write things down, then it really helps to give me clarity of thought and come up with a plan of where do I want to be? You know, what, what's the stress I want to get rid of? And how am I going to do it? And then stick to that plan. Yeah, I love that. Taking a bit of time out for yourself each day, reflecting on your life gives you perspective. And I, I totally agree about writing things down. You know, we, we've spoken about journaling on this show in, uh, in many different forms over the years because it's such a simple and effective practice to take a lot of the worries and anxieties out of our brain and popping them down onto paper. And it's really fascinating for me. You know, I talk to patients about doing that for anxiety, for stress, for all kinds of things, for insomnia. Mm. But you're talking about it in, I guess, a slightly different way, but it's to get that perspective and then looking at, well, now that I've written it down, what can I actually address? What can I do? Which goes back to what you're saying before. It's like, what can I actually do to reduce the likelihood that this is going to stress me out in the future or what can I do to change it? Absolutely, yes. I mean, when we we do a lot of time uh, looking at decision-making process, if we're trying to um, improve our capabilities to, to deal with emergencies or deal with difficult situations. And and there's there are all sorts of different processes and, and techniques out there for making a decision. But generally speaking, uh, four quick steps, you'll, you'll look at the facts. That's the kind of bit I was yeah. saying about what's the problem. Really, what's the problem? That's the fact, get the facts. Now think of the options, because if you haven't got any options, there's no decision to make. So you've got to have at least more than one option as to what can you do about it then you reason those options and then you take action well after your reasoning you've decided on the option you're taking take action very quick process and that process enables you to make a decision i think that's what causes a lot of stress and anxiety is people not knowing how to make a decision or what the right decision is to make and once you've gone through a process, you take a decision, um, it, it's the right decision at the time. You might look back in six months' time and think, well, okay, that hasn't worked out how I want it. But you can't beat yourself up about it because it was the right decision to make at the time because you, you went through this process, you made the best decision given the facts that you had and given you know the, the, the reasoning that you've been through. And I think that process just helps people yeah. to sometimes just take a decision and 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 go with it. Yeah, I love that because what we can control is the process we go through to make that decision. Sometimes we can make the right decision, but for reasons outside our control, the outcome wasn't what we wanted. But then we can fall into the trap of thinking, Oh, we made the wrong decision. Completely. Absolutely. There will always be factors outside of our control. Just look at what's happened in the last four or five years. Yeah. Um, from, from Brexit, from a pandemic to the war in Ukraine, um, inflation, cost of living crisis. These kind of things are outside of, of most people's control. They are just events yeah. that are happening that we have to react to. Um there are things that you can do to try and protect yourself to give you a buffer. Maybe it's a financial buffer, or, uh, you know, or, or something in your life to give you options. And okay, well, if this if this were to happen, then at least we could do X, Y, or Z. But but you you know, there will always be things outside of your control. And I think that a lot of anxiety and, and worry is about those those yeah. elements that, that we can't control. You said. I think in print before, uh, I've read an article where you spoke about the importance of structure and routine. I'd love to just touch on that a little bit because you've just outlined a lot of these things that happen in life that we have no control over. But if we focus on the things that we can control that helps give us that buffer, where does structure and routine fit into that? Uh, structure and routine is, is is brilliant. And a lot of people think structure and routine, oh, God, it's horrible. Oh, it's so regimented. Gosh, you know, why can't we just have a bit of flexibility? Surely life will be better if we could just have some freedom without realizing that structure and routine gives you freedom. Yeah. Because structure and routine gives you that 15-minute coffee break that is your freedom because it's there, it's in the schedule. And I'm going to take my 15-minute coffee break. If it's not in the schedule, you'll work through it. You'll just plow on through. It'll be the next email or the, you know, onto the device, checking social media, yeah. whatever it might be. Um, and on the space station, we stick to a very strict routine 
that make sure that we get adequate sleep, that make sure we get time to eat, time to exercise and time in the evenings to switch off and relax. Um, so actually structure and routine is giving us the freedom that we need. And I guess that has all intentionally been put in by the powers that be, you know, the, the experience from previous missions out into space. I guess people have learned what is the optimum thing that we must do with our astronauts to keep them performing well. I mean, you mentioned sleep. Sleep is obviously so important for our performance. Is it hard to sleep when you're up in space? It can be hard to sleep. Certainly in the in the first couple of weeks, it's... Well, why? What happens? I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> I mean, I just can't even imagine. What What do you feel... It's um, getting to sleep is hard because um, it's, you know, you're floating and um, with, <laughs> without the absence of lying down in a bed, without being able to kind of, you know, have that comfort of a pillow against your head and all these things that uh, we feel very comforting on earth and they give us the triggers to fall asleep. Without them, um, you feel like your, you know, your body isn't ready to go to sleep. Also, ultraviolet light can be really uh, t terrible for sleep. So if we go to the cupola window, for example, late at night, and it happens to be daytime, we're, we're in the daytime part of the Earth's orbit, and uh, you take a few photographs and you get this big influx of UV light, you won't sleep for the whole night. Um, your oh. body... It's um, very uh, attuned to the lighting conditions. I mean, we've evolved over <laughs> millions and millions of years to, to be attuned to a 24-hour cycle. Yeah, we have... I believe that you see, is it 16 sunrises and sunsets a day when you're in space? Is that right? That's right, yes, yeah. So how, how does that work? We're attuned to this 24-hour cycle. You're a human being. Even though you're in space, you've still got that evolutionary biology, yet you're seeing... 16 mm. sunrises and sunsets. How, how does that fit together? Well, yeah, it messes up your circadian rhythm for the first couple of weeks. And that's why it takes this while just to get used to being in space. Um, and um, what we do in the evenings is we'll now close the hatches. We'll try and prevent too much UV coming in. And on the space station today, they actually have LED lighting so they can redshift the lighting in the okay. evenings blue shift it during the day um, and, and get maximum performance, but make sure in the evenings we're kind of red shifted and we're just starting to get into that sleep rhythm. Are, are your routines then, whilst in space, kept on a 24-hour clock? Yes, we work GMT uh, and we'll have a 24-hour schedule that gives us at least seven hours of sleep, um, but we're working to a normal, what you would call a normal 24-hour schedule. Yeah. In terms of fear... You did a spacewalk. And one of the most profound things I learned as I was preparing for the conversation today is you were talking about, Tim, the feeling during that spacewalk, I think you were maybe as far as you could get from the ISS, the International Space Station. And I don't know if you actually did look or you just knew what was behind your right shoulder. I can't stop thinking about that, this idea that actually, if you were to look, it's just space. Mm. It's, there's nothing. You would, you know, maybe, can you talk me through that? What was going on? I mean, that is so hard to fathom. <laughs> Yes, it was, it was unusual, actually, because we were quite fortunate. We we had to go to the furthest edge of the space station, out to one of the far solar panels to fix it. And we got there a bit early and we had some time before. Well, what does early mean? What? Well, we, you know, we try and plan the spacewalks, you know, uh, meticulously and we give plenty of time so there's no rushing, there's no, uh, uh, you know, you're not going to make mistakes. And so when we had a, a long journey to get out to the farthest edge, there was extra buffer in there in case we'd had a problem. And Tim Coper and myself, thankfully, we moved pretty quickly. We didn't have a problem. So when we got to our work site, um, we were 10 minutes ahead of schedule. Um, but we couldn't rep repair the, the solar panel until darkness because there was live electricity just flowing down the solar panel from the sun's rays. We were only going to get 45 minutes of the night part of the orbit to get this repair job done. Um, so it was going to have to be a very you know, well-run procedure. But for the 10 minutes after we'd set up our work site, there was nothing to do, just wait for the sun to go down. So that was when I had those precious moments to kind of clip on and, and push off and just float in the blackness of space and just look out at the universe and watch the sun go down on Earth. So you pushed away. Yeah, yeah. And you were literally floating in space. Yes. Now, Tim, that is an experience 
that so few humans who currently live on planet Earth or who have ever lived on planet Earth have ever experienced. Mm. Are you able to put words to that kind of experience that even remotely explain what it felt like? Uh, I think it's incredibly hard to process fully what that experience is, is like. Um, in fact, I've spoken to several Apollo astronauts about it as well. Um, one, a, a great friend of mine, Al Warden, who's passed away now, unfortunately, but Al did a deep space spacewalk. He was on his way back from the moon and had to retrieve the film canisters um, into the command module. So he had to go out halfway back and and he was on this spacewalk picking up the film canisters and he said you know he could cover the moon with one thumb in one direction and he could cover the earth with the other thumb in the other direction just by you know that's how far away he was from from anything and um and of course my my experience wasn't quite as extreme as that but still when you're looking out at the milky way um looking away from earth and floating and not feeling any pressure on your body, no forces. All you've got is a gentle hum from the ventilation system. So it's very, very quiet, very peaceful. Um, it's a very, very strange environment, very surreal it, it, to be in that you know, environment looking down on Earth. Were you able to fully be present with that experience and appreciate it and, and be there with it? Or was a part of you scared as well? Did, did you allow your mind to go, well, what if the tether breaks? Because what if this, what if I do just float out into the blackness? Mm. Did that go through your minds? Um, no, it didn't. It, it was. That's what I think is so strange. And that's why I think it's hard to process because um, I've done some free fall parachuting and every second of the parachuting experience for me was packed with adrenaline and it mm. was almost uh, you know this this incredible feeling of excitement and um not a situation i relaxed into always a situation where i was aware that you're plummeting to earth and will the parachute open or what's my next move mm. On a spacewalk, it wasn't like that. It was I. My heart rate was probably about sixty or seventy. Um, I was incredibly relaxed, um, just enjoying that sensation of, of floating. It's like being in a warm bath of water, um, just in your suit without feeling anything, and, and unbelievable. It was it was quite a surreal experience. Now, when I first knew we had a date in the diary booked in to talk. The big thing that kept going through my head is perspective. The perspective you gain when you're in space, how does that translate to day-to-day -day regular life? You know, is it, does it feel pointless sometimes when you've seen the magnitude of the universe? You know, do you get caught up in the same stress as, as we all tend to in day-to-day -day life or are you like a zen monk because you've had this sort of huge perspective on 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 the world and, and our place in it now if, if you come into my house on a monday morning when when it's school you know we're packing the bags and have you got the of course it's exactly the same as any any other family in terms of the the day-to-day -day stresses yeah. that you get involved in but it does give you that ability to step back and just think come on you know all right what are the real problems here? What are the real stresses? Um, and and it is that sense of perspective um, that you get. I, 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 you mentioned about resilience earlier on and, and about this. Uh, it, it's something that grows throughout your entire life. Your resilience builds with the experiences that you have. So being in space will be an experience that I'll always carry with me now. And it's always something I can reflect on. And it's something I can use in my life to help me appreciate and, and and have a bit more clarity of thought on situations that arise and maintain perspective when, when the stress builds. I understand that you would have weekly calls with your family. Uh, were they video calls? Were they phone calls? And what is it like talking to your loved ones when you're not on the same planet as them? <laughs> 
um, we were able to, I was able to call back any time I wanted on, on a phone call. So uh, we've got a laptop in our crew quarters and it's a voice over IP system. So we just go to the laptop and you can dial up a number. So I'll be speaking to my friends. I had a list actually of people I'd wanted to call um, whilst in space. And um, of course, I was calling my wife regularly. Um, often it was quite funny. It was it was too regular. She was busy. She had two kids to be looking after. And, you know, I was on GMT. So in the evening when I had had my dinner and I was just, you know, getting ready for bed, I think, oh, it's time to give Rebecca a call. And, and she'd be in the middle of the day in Houston running around trying to get a million things done before the kids needed picking up from school. <laughs> it was like, okay, thanks, hon, but can't really talk now. Um, so no, we we had was that a bit of an ego check at times. It was it was hilarious, um, but yes, it it was a lot of uh, it was great to be able to call you know anybody. And then once a week we would have a video call, and that's when I would really talk to my boys. I I wouldn't they were quite young at the time, so um, during the week you know we didn't want to have it was almost getting that balance between not so much contact with daddy that they would actually miss me, but mm. enough at the weekends where we could have a video call and um, and that they could have a look. I'd be able to take them on a tour around the space station, show them the view out the window and do some somersaults and, and have fun with yeah. food and water, all that kind of stuff. Um, but as you know yourself, it's very hard to actually hold the attention of a seven-year-old and a four-year-old for very long. So often after half an hour, they were like, okay, thanks very much. We're yeah. off to go and play Lego now. I'm just wondering about the chats with your wife, you know, you know, hey, hi darling, what have you been up to? Yeah, I've done the shopping, done this. And what about you, Tim? Yeah, you know, just the usual, done the stuff in the ISS, had to do a space walk today, floated a little <laughs> bit out in the universe. Yeah. Um, see you tomorrow kind of thing. I mean, was it hard as well? Because, you know, we were talking about this in the kitchen before over coffee, this, this idea sometimes that it's, it can be hard to mix work life and home life sometimes. And you're out there, um, there's, there's huge risk. Yes, you trained for it, but you're out there to do a job, very important job for your team, but for humanity as well, right? In terms of our progress as a species. Talking to your children and your wife brings you back to your other life, you know, your personal life. Was that challenging? Um, it was It was never something that I, I really felt uh, tearful about or sad about because we had prepared so long for this moment. We knew what was coming up. We knew it was a six-month mission. I knew I'd be missing Christmas and New Year and anniversary and birthdays and and we had kind of plans in place and, and uh, to, to deal with that. So... Um, it was a case of, of, I think, knowing beforehand that you were making this sacrifice, you're going to be away from your family. But, um, of course, that connection with Earth um, always brings you back to that situation. My, my, my worry was always about my family. What if something happens to them? You know, I was always concerned that they would have the support structure in place and, and be okay and be able to deal with things. Um and uh, and the space agencies have a very good network to enable your families to have that support if mm -hmm. something were to happen. So um, it wasn't really uh, it wasn't a feeling of, of sadness. It was actually a, it was very good for my morale to have that yeah. connection back to Earth. There, there's a, a nice moment I heard about. Um, you know, we share a mutual friend in Philip McCabe, and I remember a few years ago Philip telling me. Uh, I I would often go uh, and ski in Chamonix and me and Philip would often ski together. I wasn't there at this time, but he told me about um, a moment at the end of January when it, it was, a, I think it was a, a powder day in Chamonix. He had skied uh, Le Vanche Bowl, which I know super well. And at the bottom, he just completed the run and his phone's ringing. And... He picks up his mobile and it says ISS, International <laughs> Space Station. And he answered and he said it was you phoning to wish him happy 50th birthday from the International Space Station, which, <laughs> and it was such a wonderful uh, story in a moment. And then he said he got on the ski lift back up and he was chatting to you on the way. And, you know, Philip would say we could ask him about what his experience was of actually talking to someone who's in space. But that's a really nice moment, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, how special it is to be able to ring your friends and, and you know, from space and just have a chat. And I think for me, actually, they, I think they didn't realise 
probably that I was getting more from the conversation than perhaps they were. Mm -hmm. Because for them, it's an incredible experience. Somebody from the space station has rung me and we're talking. But actually for me, it was having that connection, that connection back to Earth, connection to my friends, to my family. Um, and when you're off planet for six months and you're looking down at, at humanity and... You need that, you know, we, uh, that's what I think is going to be so challenging for the crews that go to Mars on those missions and they'll watch Earth just disappear to this small light in the sky, no bigger than a, a star. And that connection back to Earth is going to be so important and that's something that we've, we've realised, I think, um, within the space agencies. Um, so it, it was, uh, and I think also that uh, going back to the point about bringing my, um, my family and, and uh, my wife, and she was just so incredible for that entire mission. There was not a single phone call where she allowed herself to get upset or tearful or mm. to tell me about the stresses of her day. And I know that she was, you know, busy and having a hard time you know, being a single mum for a, several months whilst I'm away. And and yet none of that was passed on to me. And I think that's where it really helps is having that support structure, for, you know, that enables you to go out and do an extraordinary job. Yeah. Was that something you spoke about beforehand? Do you think that was something that your wife intentionally thought about? Like, actually, look, Tim's away. I'm not going to make it harder than it needs to be. You know, what, what, was that just something she did off her own back or had you guys spoken about things like this as well? She did that off her own back. I know that. Um, we, we, you know, she's been incredible and uh, she's supported me when I was test flying and, um, you know, I went off to Afghanistan. And I know there's been moments where she's been worried, very worried about what I'm going to do and she has never let it show. She's just cracked on as normal, um, as if it's just a normal day of family life and see you, Tim, bye-bye, off to work. Um, and I know that she's, you know, working very hard to, to enable me to be able to go off and do what I need to do. Now, a lot of the time when people become parents, their attitude to risk starts to change. I certainly feel in my own life that very much has been the case. I mean, we mentioned skiing before, the sort of off-piste runs I used to do on glaciers, with crevasses. I'm just not sure. I have been skiing for a few years, having said that, but I'm just not sure um, I would be happy with that risk benefit equation anymore now that I have dependents. And so what's interesting for me, if I look at your life from the outside, to me at least, you were doing lots of risky things in your life. Anyway, you were you know, in the army, you were flying Apache helicopters, you were doing all kinds of stuff, right? But arguably, or certainly to me at least, one of the riskiest things you have done left the Earth's orbit. Even as I say that, it just sounds ridiculous to me. Um, you know, you did that and experienced that after you had kids. Mm. So I get that you're trained to be focused, to be able to actually just look at the problem in hand. And I can tell that from talking to you, you're very... It's, it's really wonderful. You're very methodical. It's very, um, it's, it's very systematic. And I kind of think, well, of course it would be. Why? That must be a trait that is required to be able to be an astronaut. Did any part of you ever think, hey, look, I'm going to space. This is awesome. It's a great opportunity. But if I die, I leave my kids fatherless. Did that go into your mind at all at any point? Most definitely, yes. And um, when I was selected back in 2009, Rebecca was pregnant with Thomas, our eldest son. So um, where really, you know, my, my career as an astronaut has been with children. Um, yeah. But when I was going for the process and going for selection, um, we didn't have children. I was not prepared for how much becoming a father changed me. Right. Um, you mentioned there about your whole attitude to risk changing, your whole your whole life changing. Um, and it's very easy to be told that when you don't have children, yeah. oh, your life will change. You don't fully, every parent knows that you do not fully appreciate how your life will change and how your emotions will change and how you'll feel about the responsibility to a, another individual um, after you become a parent. And so that really struck me. And, uh, and it was something that I had to deal with that I hadn't expected mm. to have to deal with. So 
there was very much that balancing of of, of my in my within myself that bit justifying what am I doing between my responsibility as a, a parent and, and as a husband versus my responsibility to to myself and my career, and I think that it was really coming to terms with the fact that you also have to be yourself, you have to be true to yourself and honest. And I think you're setting an example to your children. Yeah. And if I were to stop doing what I was doing, if I was to stop being who I was as a person yeah. all my life as a pilot, test pilot, astronaut, if I was to stop that because of my children, what would they then think of me? And and how would, yeah. what would the new me be? How would I, what would I go and do? And how would I act? And and I think that that is really the balance to be struck. It's okay, yes, I know I do a job where there's perhaps more risk than many other jobs, but I've got to be true to myself yeah. and I've got to set the example to my children. Yeah, I really appreciate you sharing that because I think many of us in our own way face similar challenges you know, when we have dependents, um, when we have a partner, uh, people who rely on us. You know, it's easy to stop doing all the things that make you you to, you know, nourish that. But I I've also learned over the past years, yeah, but part of you has to be you as well. And I guess it's for each and every single one of us to find, you know, where is that sweet spot for us? What are we happy with? What is our family and the people around us happy with. But I think there's one right answer, is there? We've all got to kind of come to that conclusion for ourselves. We have, yes, absolutely. And and you mentioned about your, you. I think you'll look at risk in a different way. And that's absolutely fine. You'll look at that glacier, you'll look at that potential avalanche and you'll think, you know, okay, really, really, am I going to do that? And I, in the same way, I'll look at things now and I will perhaps analyze the risk in more detail and, 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 and being a parent will uh, affect my decision maybe. But I think you'll still, you know, be able to take that risk yeah. and you still have to be true to yourself. I want to talk about these transferable skills of resilience that we can all work on and cultivate in ourselves. Because as I say, I think that's relevant for every single one of us. So let's talk about this. Um, you know, you get chosen and then there's a preparation period of what, six years? Is that right? It was six years for myself. Um, you can do it faster. We, that was basically just the order in which we were flying as astronauts. Um, but it will be a minimum of about four years. Minimum of four years. Okay, so you get chosen to be an astronaut and there's a minimum of four years of training so that actually when you go on your mission, you are as well prepared as you can possibly be to make that a success. So let's go through... In fact... Let's go through that in a moment. Let's just back up to you getting chosen. Am I right in thinking that you didn't necessarily want to be an astronaut as a kid? It wasn't like a burning desire, but you saw an advert <laughs> and you just thought, yeah, that sounds good. I mean, what, what happened there? Yes, um, it's quite funny because I, I, I've, you know, on occasion I felt like a bit of a fraud compared to some of my colleagues with ESA who have been that four or five year old girl or boy dreaming of being an astronaut and doing everything in their life to, to work up to that moment. And um, I've lived my life really not looking more than about two years ahead, I think. Um, I've been passionate about what I do when I was a cadet at school, about flying and knowing I wanted to be a pilot. And then when I was a pilot, uh, but I didn't I didn't even want to be a test pilot when I first joined the Army Air Corps. I didn't want to be an instructor. I just wanted to fly. And now, well, What is a test pilot? So a, a test pilot is somebody who takes aircraft, uh, experimental aircraft, either either brand new aircraft off the production line and tests them, uh, making sure that they're safe. Or you take an existing aircraft and you try and expand the flying envelope. You you push the boundaries of what it's possible to do. So like a human guinea pig. Yes, kind of. <laughs> but uh, but I guess again, it's in a in a very we we approach uh, we approach risk in a very incremental process. So, okay. So with the Apache helicopter, for example, it was it was produced, it, it was in service, but we needed it to do more more than it was originally designed to do. So the test pilots will take it and slowly push the envelope of what is it really capable of doing. And sometimes you reach the envelope and you realise, okay, that's it. Yeah. Um, but you're there to, to make it safe for frontline operational pilots to fly. Okay. So a super important job. 
Absolutely, yes, yeah. um, because you're the one who's who's pushing. You're you're setting the limits. You're writing the checklists. You're yeah. deciding how to deal with the emergency situations. Um, so it's a it's a very important job, very rewarding job. Yeah. Um, uh, but it does teach you how to approach a problem in an incremental manner and how to deal with risk. It's all about risk management. So you see this advert. I don't know. Did you you email? You phone? What 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 did you do? Did you think, yeah, astronaut? That sounds good. <laughs> what 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 went through your heads? So I'd been working as a test pilot for about five years, and and when I saw the advert, um, absolutely, I thought, you know, I have to go for this. It's uh, it's a it's a dream job, um, and uh, it it was very fortuitous because it it suited my circumstances at the time. I was um, leaving the the army. I was getting a job uh, as a civilian test pilot. And so I was in a transition period anyway, and, and thankfully, just a couple of years before, I had got a degree in flight dynamics, um, and I did that. Uh, that was at the age of thirty-three. So um, having left school after A levels, and I needed that degree really to become an astronaut. That was um, that wasn't mandatory, but looking back now, I can see that it was. Uh, you know, they they haven't selected any astronauts who didn't have a degree qualification. So I had the right qualifications, right time, right age, and um, just decided to apply. Now. There were 8,000 applicants, I believe. You got chosen. That is a staggering achievement, I would say, in and of itself. But if I think about it, I would imagine that those 8,000 applicants were all pretty high caliber anyway. Certainly the last 1,000, right, must be everyone's pretty damn good at what they're doing already. So... You know, as you were going through that process, can you shed some light for us as to what that experience is like? It, it morphed throughout the selection process. It was interesting because when I first went for it, it, it was a case of, I mean, I, I, although I hadn't wanted to be an astronaut when I was four or five years old, as my career progressed, I had worked much more closely with the space industry. As a test pilot, we worked closely with the space industry. So I knew a lot more about space. I was excited and interested in space. So it wasn't that um, it was kind of out of the blue and this was a brand new thing that, that I thought I'd just give it a shot. Um, there was definitely, you know, some, some huge amount of desire to do the role. But as you go through the selection process, you go from a position, or certainly myself, I, I went from thinking, I don't have a chance of getting this, but I've got to give it a go. And it will be a wonderful experience. I'm going to take the positives from it. And however far I may or may not get through the process, then 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 it's going to be great fun. So I started on this journey <laughs> with that in mind. But as you progress through and your chances increase, you become very emotionally involved, which I wasn't at the start. At the start, yeah. I was able to be a bit standoffish about it. Um, and then as I came, got closer and closer and closer, um, you start to really, really want it. Uh, and that's when I started to struggle because, of course, there's this burning desire within you that you really you know, want to become an astronaut and you think you might have a chance of getting it. Uh, and going back to what we said earlier about fear and how in to make good decisions, you need to take some time away and almost stay detached so you can make good decisions. I guess in some ways, those strong emotions, that fear, like I'm in the final 10, you know, I'm close, but the other nine are probably all pretty damn good. <laughs> um, potentially that could have impacted how you performed at at those final tests, mm. did you, were you aware of that? Did you have to go through a process to make sure you didn't allow that emotion, uh, that potential fear of missing out on this, you know, <laughs> once in a lifetime opportunity kind of get in the way? Did you have to do anything about that? Yes, I, I mean, consciously trying to relax before uh, interviews and then having, again, thinking about the whole process. And there, there's the element of preparation, but then being honest yourself. So on the preparation side, you need to show that you've been committed, you're dedicated. So you've got to learn and revise and study about what your potential role is going to be. And, and the space agencies will want to know that you've done the homework and, and you appreciate what you're letting yourself in for. But then not to let the preparation slip into your personality and your character. That that's where it's got to be honest and genuine and authentic. And you've got to make that delineation. And because there's nothing worse than than going to an interview and trying to pretend to be somebody who you're not. Yeah. Um, they will see through that 
And also, it's you're not being fair to yourself and you're not being fair to your employer. Uh, and that's where I think that um, I was able to kind of just relax and think to myself, if I'm the right person for the job and if they like me, then they'll pick me. And if I'm yeah. not the right person for the job, then I shouldn't be picked. And so you kind of go in there and then try and just keep yourself relaxed. And now on the other side of the fence, we're, we've got a selection, astronaut selection process on this year and I've now been interviewing candidates and, and it's so important to do that because we have so little time with the candidates um, that we have to know them. We have to really know them because we're the space agencies are going to make a huge investment in that person. And it's all about um, a low-risk candidate, a low risk from having a medical emergency, a, a low risk from kn knowing that that person's going to be able to cope with the training, um, be able to speak another language, be able to you know, develop uh, or do spacewalks, etc. But in order to have a low risk of, of knowing someone's personality and character, they have to open up quickly in a one hour interview. By the end of that hour, we have to know that candidate very well. And we've had some candidates who have been brilliant on paper, but just did not allow themselves to open up. And that's where they're doing themselves an injustice because if the, if the employer doesn't get to know you fully, how can they possibly make an informed decision? Why did you get chosen over 8,000 others? Um, it's a, a whole mixture of different things. Obviously, the skills there's the, the, that get tested throughout the selection process, there are tests you have to pass. There's a psychological profile that obviously my profile fit, the, the, the desired profile. Um, then you get it analysed in your soft skills when you're doing teamwork exercises and things like that. Um, interview process. Ultimately, it boils down to, as I kind of mentioned there, somebody that the space agencies have the most confidence in that that person is going to be able to fulfil the role and be an ambassador for space as well. Um, and there are so many people who can do that job. When I got into the final 10, any one of, of the yeah. 10 of us could have done it. There were 20 of us who passed the medical. Any one of those 20 could have done a brilliant job of being an astronaut. So the, when it comes down to the final stages, I think it's just the small details of um, your personality and character. And that's ultimately where you get picked or not picked. Do you know some of the other nine who were in that final 10 and didn't get the gig in the end? I do. Uh, and in fact, one of them, uh, Matthias Maurer, who's a German uh, astronaut, ha was subsequently picked up. Oh, so, fantastic. Um, and he's now flown to space, done a spacewalk. Um, so that was great. I became great friends with Matthias. In terms of this uh, training then, this it was six years for you, but a minimum of four years. You've been chosen, so you've got the gig. You know you're now, you've been chosen to be an astronaut. It sounds like there's all kinds of different things that they train you for. You, you mentioned resilience. They take you to these these like remote caves where it's dark, it's cold. Um, what is the principle there that we can take? Like if we want to improve our resilience, what's the principle we can learn from what they did with you guys to train you to be astronauts? What can we do in our kind of more regular lives to train to become more resilient for ourselves? Um, I think maybe look at something that you've, you've always wanted to do but have been putting it off for one reason or another and, um, and go and do it. <laughs> so um, the, the, you know, the, we, we get pushed out of our comfort zone because that's when you will start to really identify someone's personality and character, how they deal with difficult circumstances, how they deal with stress, how they manage themselves. And, and that's where you start learning lessons. I, you know, I now know what I'm like when I'm tired and grumpy and, and I'm cold and wet and I haven't eaten for four days. Um, and I know what my thought process becomes and, and, I, and I know better now how to manage my emotions and, and I know how to help other people. So... Yeah, that, that's interesting because you, you've said that, haven't you, before in an interview that you learn, I think, in the army that if you want to know someone's true personality, make them go take them somewhere dark, make them cold, make them hungry, make them tired, right? I, I've, and, I, and I love that. Is that our true personality or is that um, put someone in that situation 
let's say you get grumpy and you fall out with someone. How does that help us become more resilient? Um, I think that it, it teaches you about how you are when uh, you know you're out of your comfort zone. It's very easy for people to, you know, to put on a, a facade and and, to, and if they're everything is very good yeah. in their lives and everything is smooth and, and etc. But when the chips are down, it's you know there is no hide. There are no hiding places. Um, you are who you are. Are you really going to go the extra mile to help somebody out to be selfless? Um, and are you going to offer that bit of food when you know that you'd rather eat the whole thing because you're so hungry? Um, you know, are you going to volunteer to do an extra night shift when you haven't slept already for three days? Um, these kind of things that that um, just enable you to be able to get have the strength to analyse your character and personality and to, to go the extra mile. And presumably then by doing that, you may find some aspects of your personality that you don't like, you think, actually, mm. you know what, I didn't behave as well as I would have liked to have behaved with my colleague in that situation. So is the lesson then that put yourself in these uncomfortable situations, be honest, learn about yourself, and then go back and see if you can apply the new learnings in a different way? Completely. And part of the most interesting part of these exercises is the peer reviews afterwards. Because you can learn about yourself, but that's just you analysing it. But when you sit down afterwards and you, <laughs> and you do have a cup of coffee and you've had a nice meal and you've had a good night's sleep, and it's like, right, let's talk about that. And, and, and we will analyse the situations and have the peer reviews and people will then say, well, Tim, you know, really didn't appreciate that time in the cave where, you know, this happened and and that could have been handled so much more differently. And and you kind of think, wow, you know, I yeah. had no idea that maybe something I was doing or uh, was was having that effect on somebody else. And, and there is so much to learn. So I think it's also important. Yeah. It's not just about one individual having self-reflection. It's about other people being able to tell you how it impacted on them. And, and did that help you? That in that, that that sort of experience in the cold, dark caves. Can you think of actually when you were on the International Space Station, did those learnings there transfer? Was there a situation where it was difficult and stressful and actually go, no, you know what? I, I, I remember then I, I, I came across not as, I don't know, considerate as I could have done, like whatever it might have been. Is it, is it you know, I'm not, maybe it wasn't that one thing. Is it just bit by bit you, you build up these skills so actually when you need it, you've just got, more resource to draw from. Mm, completely, yes, and confidence to be able to do something. Um, I remember one time during training and um, we, we end up you know, traveling around a lot and sleep patterns get dis disturbed. And I was doing a very, very stressful spacewalk test. Sorry to interrupt. If you are enjoying this content, there's loads more just like it on my channel. So please do take a moment to press subscribe, hit the notification bell. And now back to the conversation. Um, in the swimming pool in Houston. And um, I just could not sleep the night before. I had absolutely zero sleep the night before. And uh, I was driving to the swimming pool at six o'clock in the morning. I was, and we go down for six hours at a time underwater. And I knew it was going to be one of the most stressful days of training in, in my life. Um, and I was really, really worried about my cognitive ability and, mm. and the lack of sleep. And, and I sailed through the test. You know, it wasn't easy, but I managed to pass it. And I just remember drawing so much strength from that, thinking, okay, you know, I know now that if I if I don't sleep the night before a spacewalk up on the space station, I know I can go out and do it. Yeah. Um, and uh, you've got to you know, you've got to be able to draw those lessons. I, I love that. I, I have an exercise called the five step release that um, I wrote about in in one of my books, and I've used it with my patients for years who struggle with anxiety, and they just have to simply answer five questions you know, what's one thing I'm anxious about today? Uh, what's one reason I know I can probably handle it? What's one reason it probably won't be as bad as I think it's going to be? Like, there's a, there's a series of sim five simple questions. But a couple of them remind me of what you just said, which is, one of them is, you know, what's one reason I know I can probably handle it? Because when you have done difficult things, and again, you you have a bit of space and you can reflect and go, well, yeah, I'm knackered. I've got to do this difficult thing today. But you know what? I've been tired and done difficult things in the past. 
it, it, it just brings it to light. You go, oh yeah, you know what? Yeah, it's, it's probably going to be tricky, but I know I can handle it because I've handled difficult things already. Mm. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. it, it is about, you know, there's the tools in the toolbox. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and there's nothing like, is there? This, this, you know, I, I took a bit of time off this summer and I've done a lot of deep reflection about life, you know, what I'm doing, you know, the world, <laughs> you know, the sort of things that we, we often do when we have time on our hands. And I keep thinking about this phrase about evidence and you know, we're, we're so keen these days to look for evidence and expertise from other people. And again, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But I think we forget about the best form of evidence, which is when we do something for ourselves or we experience it. Like I genuinely feel that experience is one of the best forms of evidence for ourselves. Like you can read about, oh, it's good to do difficult things. Yeah, yeah, I know that's important. That's kind of cognitive, rational, but do it, feel it, go through it, that is immeasurably more important than kind of knowing this stuff, right? It's actually going through it and doing it, isn't it? It is, yeah. And um, and that's where uh, you know, coming back to structure and routine, I think, helps because sometimes that is the thing. It's it's hard to put the time aside to do it. It's, uh, you yeah. know, we might have all these things that we, we want to try and want to do, but then everyday life gets in the way and suddenly the, the normal routine kicks in and, and we never have enough time for ourselves. Um, so it's about making that time for yourself and, and, and achieving these goals that you might yeah. have. Um, yeah, and carving out the time. Yeah. You mentioned soft skills before, you know, how do you get on with people, communication, these kind of things. And I know from previous conversations I've heard you have, Tim, that those were things that they looked at really, really carefully before choosing who was going to be their astronaut. Because I think we probably take it for granted that, yeah, you guys have got to be medical specimens. You've got to be, you know, a low risk of something going wrong. So I'm guessing all your blood parameters and your blood pressure and and please correct me if I'm wrong, I'm guessing all those things must be pretty optimal all around. So like, yeah, we, we're going to invest millions, maybe more than millions in this person. Um, we don't want a simple medical problem to botch the whole thing. So I think we kind of understand that that's important. How does this guy manage stress? You know, that's important. But the soft skills, how you interact with other people, what happens when you're tired, you know, you're in a pretty confined space, right? So talk to me about these soft skills and, and why they're so important. Yes, they are. Because they're, they're so important because it's an area where the space agency just have to be able to trust you implicitly as an ambassador when you're traveling around, um, when you're working with your colleagues from Japan, from Canada, from America, from Russia, from all the other member states in Europe. And, and you are going to be a, a, a trusted individual who's going to represent yourself, represent the agency, but um, also, of course, not... Uh, cause a risk of conflict um, because that would be the worst case scenario on board the space station where you're in a confined environment and suddenly you've got a, a crew conflict going on and then that's going to impact the entire operating environment. So the soft skills are, are, are important on, on both levels, at kind of that ambassadorial yeah. level and on the operational level. All the soft skills, the, the, the whole package of, of being able to uh, appreciate where you are, what the environment is, how you should act and to recognize in yourself when you might be being a bit irrational. What about some of those simple things like, you know, we imagine what do you eat in space? How, how do you go to the toilet when there's no gravity? Like, <laughs> I don't know, but I mean, can you, can you just talk us through some of that? Well, it's amazing how routine it becomes, how normal it becomes. Um, eating is a normal event, really, in the fact that um, we, we just have to be careful with our food. It's all heated up in tins or foil pouches or rehydrated. Um, we don't want to make a mess in the space station, so you've got to be careful. But your, your actual bodily process of eating is, is pretty normal. Um, we do end up having to kind of force ourselves to eat a little bit more because you um, feel full up very quickly. Um, which is something 
sometimes a bit uncomfortable as well. Yeah. Um, and we need to make sure that we take on enough calories. Uh, for the first few weeks in space, I just wasn't eating nearly enough because I didn't feel like I needed to. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then when I had my nutritional assessment, realized I'd lost five kilograms and then it's okay, now let's up the calorific content. But it's a, it's a normal experience. Uh, sleeping, once you get used to it, is fantastic. Um, going to the loo, uh, you need to be very careful to switch the fan on because <laughs> that's what keeps everything clean and tidy. Um, right. In the absence of gravity, airflow does the same job, really. Yeah. Um, so we have to keep the fans going all over the space station because that keeps the airflow mixing. If we weren't mixing the air, then little pockets of carbon dioxide would build up around us as we breathe out. They would just hang around our head. Um, so it's the airflow, the fans that keep everything going, you know, mixing up a do you still need to practice resilience? Because you put yourself in difficult situations in, you know, the sort of situations that very few hu humans will put themselves into. So you develop those skills. You must be incredibly resilient. You've had to keep your cool when, you know, your spacecraft is trying to dock in the middle of space and there's a problem. Um do you still need to practice resilience or is it in you now? You've done your training, so you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good. No, I think you'll constantly have to practice your resilience and, and um, you might have a, a, a set of skills that can handle a particular situation very well, but there are you know other aspects of your life where you may not have the skill set to, to deal with that. And so I think we're, we always have to you know, build resilience as we go through life. We have to um, look at the situations as they're evolving. Um, you know, as a, as a parent, um, every stage of your child's development is a new chapter. And it requires new yeah. ways of dealing with things. Um, so I'm permanently learning as a parent how to deal uh, with with situations. And I find that a fascinating journey, but it's also a journey of resilience as well. But, but maybe the best resilience training, being a parent. <laughs> I think it is. Um, I want to talk to you about transition zones. This is something I talk to my patients a lot about, that transitional space in the day between, let's say, home and work or between work and home, you know, are you just going straight from your emails and your busy work life into family life? You know, I think this became a real problem over the last years with working from home, no kind of transition. And I know that you have said that going to space, the transition from regular earth life to space life was actually okay because there was it was meticulously trained for, you'd practiced, there was a whole team looking after you, making sure that, you know, you were prepared for that. So that was a relatively easy transition from what I understand. Mm. But from space back to Earth into family life, that was a bit more challenging, wasn't it? Yes, it was much more challenging coming back down. Um, and it wasn't so much um, family life. I think that that happened very smoothly, um, just kind of straight straight into, into being a parent and a husband again. But it was that um, the whole transition, I think, for me, just... Um, trying to process the mission. And I, I came back to a very, very busy environment where your body is literally a guinea pig. You're being uh, analysed for various science experiments over the first days and weeks. You need to go through a period of physical rehabilitation. Your muscles uh, need to be built, built up, your lower back and your core strength. Um, and at the same time, you're exceptionally busy. You have to travel around the world again, doing debriefs with each mission control centers. Wow. Um, and I think it, it's that period of, of having so much um, uh, calm, if you like, of being... Uh, the space station is a very busy place to work, but it's such a structured place to work. And there are just a few of you up there. And you get into this environment, uh, this isolated m mindset. And there is no time when you get back to Earth, there is no time to just process what you've been through. Um, you're straight into it. And I found that very difficult. And I guess it's hard to process because if you're with your family or your mates, like no one knows what you've been through. Like to process stuff, sometimes we, we kind of need a shared experience with someone else. Mm. Hey, you know, you remember that? It was like, is that tricky sometimes that what how many people have been up into space do you know we're we're up in the 500s now um okay. over 50 years um but that, that's 500 people ish 
in the history of all human life on this planet have mm. experienced what you've experienced. So is there something really powerful about being with other astronauts? Can you, can you process, can you kind of go through stuff in a completely different way? Because they kind of know what you've been through. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's like anybody who's been through somebody and has a shared experience. It's yeah. probably only the people that they've been through that experience with that can truly understand them. Um, and so there is an element of that. And I think what's one of the challenging things is actually when we come back from a, a mission to space, we don't have the time um, to, to do that. We, we, uh, I landed with Tim and, and Yuri, so two people I'd spent you know, not just six months in space with, but I'd spent two years training intensively with. And within 12 hours of landing, the three of us were going three different directions yeah. and uh, didn't see each other again for another couple of months. So you're into a very busy environment. Now, in the military, we, we've learned over the years how to do transition periods much better when you come back from an operational environment. Um, soldiers won't go straight into a domestic environment. There'll be a, a period right. where they can just have a few days, maybe a week as a unit uh, decompressing and being able to talk about the situation and being able to normalize their situation before going into a domestic environment again. And we've discovered that really helps yeah. um, because you do need those transition periods. I guess a lot of companies have realized that, don't they? That they, they need to have debriefs or you need to have, um, you know, intentionally have some time where you can process what's happened. It's not the same thing, but I guess, you know, on this show, we, we have a lot of deep conversations where sometimes I feel quite, you know, that, that I've, I've I'm potentially not the same person afterwards as I was beforehand, depending on who I'm talking to and what we discuss. And sometimes I found that if I then go straight into seeing my wife or my kids, I just can't be present. And actually what often ends up happening is Gareth, who records all the conversations, we we often spend half an hour chatting afterwards just... Mm. And I guess we've we, we it wasn't intentional, but I think if we were to think about it, we'd probably say that it's probably quite important for us to do that before we re-engage with normal life. Do you know, so we, mm. I guess, you know... I'm not saying this is the same thing as coming back from space to Earth at all, but the principle is the same, isn't it? It is the same, yes, absolutely. You you know, when you've been through an experience that's, that's so extraordinary, you do need time, you need to reflect, and you've got your own questions you need to answer, yeah. and, and you have to allow your body and your mind to go through that process. Tim, so having spent so much time in space, and I know you took up photography in space, and I've seen some of the beautiful images that you've taken... Do you find it hard sometimes to experience awe on planet Earth? You know, if you go to a beautiful forest or you look out into your garden, you know, can you still experience the beauty in that? Or does the fact that you've seen things that most of us will never see you know, how, how does that change your kind of experience of day-to-day -day life, do you think? I, th I think, if anything, I appreciate it more back wow. here on Earth now. Um, yes, uh, I think that, you know, I, I, that connection with nature means so much more to me now because when you're living off the planet, the one thing that you look at every day down on Earth is just this beautiful jewel, this oasis of life and and the seasons are changing and the, you're watching the weather systems and um, I, I, and you want that connection with nature. And the space station is quite a sterile environment, artificial lighting, artificial atmosphere. Mm. There's no green anywhere. <laughs> and you start craving nature. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do when I got back down, I just wanted to go running in the woods. And I wanted to be out in the rain. It was raining and I was, and everyone was coming inside. I said, I'm going outside. I just want to stand in the rain. Um, oh, I love that. And you just, you kind of appreciate it more rather than less. There's a lot of talk about the planet at the moment and what humans are doing to the planet. One of the most powerful things I, I, I heard you say, certainly for me, was that you realize that when you look down on Earth, from space, that there are no borders. And I've been thinking about that a lot over the last few days, that there are no borders. It's, you know, what... When you had that realisation or when you were aware of that, 
what kind of went through your minds? Um, I think it just emphasizes uh, to you know how important it is that we we cooperate and we collaborate here on Earth, and, and sometimes it, it trivializes the problems that are going on. Um, not to say that they are they are trivial problems at all, but I think that when you see from space the bigger picture, yeah. you kind of think, why are we doing this? Why is that a problem? Um, you know, if everybody could experience this and look at Earth. Um, I think it's, it's it's almost one of those things that w w w um, as you go through life, you, your boundaries expand and your perspective changes. Um, and when you grow up, you might be, uh, when I was in the Cubs, you know, I was I was at Westbourne Cubs and, and Westbourne was, was, I was loyal to Westbourne. Westbourne was yeah. the best. And, and then, um, you know, you go to school in West Sussex and then you play county <laughs> county games and then you join the army and it's the British army. And uh, yeah. so I'm, I'm loyal to the, to the UK. And I joined the European Space Agency and I'm a European. I'm representing <laughs> Europe. Then you go to space and you're an earthling. Yeah. Um, and you think, yeah, we're all earthlings. We're all representing earth. And it's almost as if we need, we need an alien civilization to be, able to, to be able to communicate with so that we can actually appreciate yeah. what we are as a species and what we do as a species and to try and raise our game a little bit. Yeah, yeah it's, it's so powerful that because when I heard you say that, that there's no borders, when you look at earth from space, I just thought, it's all man-made. We, we're making up these distinctions between us and them. And, you know, they, these are all artificial man-made things. You know, we do this in this country, you do that in that country. But sure, fine, maybe there's some benefits for some reasons. But that big perspective that we're all in this together, that we are earthlings, I think we all could experience that. <laughs> That would change humanity a lot, I think. I mean, I don't think it's realistic to get us all into space. In fact, what was really interesting to him uh, last night at your talk when you asked the audience how many of you uh, would like to go to space? There weren't that many hands up. No. Is that normal? It depends when there's a younger audience. <laughs> last night was quite a late show and it's a school night. Um, so there weren't so, so many youngsters, but um, the younger generation all put their hands up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, and that's what I think is so great when I, you know, go around talking to schools and or with the scouts and, uh, you know, the the youngsters are just um, so excited about yeah. about space. And I think we all are at some point in our lives. We look up to the stars, we ask the big questions, and we wonder about our existence. Yeah. And um, uh, but yes, yeah, so I, I I draw a lot of strength from that as well. Let's talk about children. I know you're super passionate about children. Um, and there's kind of two areas I'd, I'd love to talk about. First of all, I only found out yesterday that, you know, I think you would regard yourself as perhaps not the best student growing up. Is that fair to say? <laughs> I, I don't know. That's, that's... that's more than fair to say. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm trying to respectfully. <laughs> but the, the, the point I'm trying to make is yeah. that we would look at you, I think many of us, as an astronaut, as someone who, you know, for want of a better term, beats 8,000 other applicants to get the job. And it's tempting for us to think, you know, Tim must have just been the man for, since he was born, like top of his class at everything, excelling at sports, doing this. Yeah, he was always going to be an astronaut. But from mm. what I understand from what I've heard about your life is that that was not the case. Not at all, no. And and again, I, I love telling this story when I go to to visit schools. The teachers don't like it so much. But, you know, I, I left school at 19. I got a C, D and an E in my A-levels. And I joined the military. And I went off and I flew helicopters. But, uh, uh, you know, I ended up gaining a degree uh, in my 30s in flight dynamics. I never stopped studying after leaving school. Suddenly things became more relevant to me as a pilot. I understood why I needed to know about maths. I mm -hmm. understood why I needed to know about physics. And, um, and it was just everybody matures, everybody develops at a different stage. And I think it's great for young people to realise that... Um, you know, that the, there's always opportunities. There's always learning, continual development, continual education. Doors don't close. You know, you've got to keep opportunities open. And uh, I, I think that that helps some young people to realise that um, if it's not all working out when the system says it should work out, 
that's not necessarily a problem. You yeah. know, um, you can chart your own course and, and you can always go back and, and, and revisit things. And, um, uh, and so, uh, you know, I, that's why I'm so passionate about, you know, making sure that youngsters um, try and develop yeah. personality and character and, and, and experience those other extracurricular activities where they can interact with people, they yeah. can gain the soft skills. Um, so my, I had a huge crisis of confidence when I was going through the selection process in that very first stage, the hard skills phase the tests, the maths and the engineering. I was there with people who had, you know, doctorates, people who are working down at CERN, um, people who are way, way more qualified than I was academically. And I felt like a complete lightweight in their company. Mm. Um, and I thought, well, you know, I'll give it my best shot. Uh, and when I passed that phase, I remember thinking, wow, you know, well, if, if I've passed that, the rest of it, is just down to me. It's down to who I am as a person, and I can do that. I can I can put on, mm. you know, a, a, a good show. I can show the agencies what I'm capable of. I can demonstrate who I am, um, and so that was, uh, you know, for, for me that was probably the biggest hurdle was yeah. passing that. And I think that's where I, when I speak to young people. It's like, look, you know, don't you, you don't underestimate what you can achieve. You've got the potential. You've got the capability. Just give it a shot. Yeah, that is super inspiring and super empowering. You've got a new book out for kids at the moment. Um, who's it for? What's it about? Yeah, this is the, the cosmic diary of our incredible universe. And um, it's about, I mean, it's really aimed at, at sort of eight to 12. And it's, uh, it's about how we came into existence. But it's about you. It's about you as a person. I think sometimes we look up to the stars and we look at it, we look at the universe, and we don't associate ourselves with the universe. So this is a book where the diary is, uh, so the universe has written its own diary from the, the very beginnings, from the Big Bang, as to how did you get here? You know, the evolution of, of stars, of galaxies, of neutron stars and black holes and planetary development and, and, and up to you. Um, but not forgetting that where you came from. You know, we are yeah. stardust. We've all been forged in the furnaces out in the in the galaxies, in the universe. And, and we are the consciousness of the universe. And and that's why we're special. You are special. Yeah. Life is special. Life is incredibly special. That book sounds as though it might be quite good for adults <laughs> as well. I think I'm quite keen. I think I'll buy that for my kids and maybe when they fall asleep I might sneak it into my room that sounds um sounds really interesting I think it's going to help a lot of people Tim I got shivers then when you were talking right we're all made up of stardust we are the consciousness of the universe you have a perspective when you say that that most of us don't uh, and I think this is huge for me. You know, first of all, I don't know if you're religious at all, if you'd ever consider yourself religious, uh, but I'm interested as to how your view on life, on humanity, spirituality, you know, how, how has that experience of going to space changed your fundamental view on who we are as humans on this planet? I am continually, you know, searching for answers to questions. I think that's the scientist in me. And um, so I, I'm not a religious person, but that doesn't mean um, I'm not, uh, you know, a spiritual person or is not that I uh, keep myself completely open to all ideas, all opportunities. There comes a point where science stops and, and we run out of answers and we're constantly pushing that boundary we're constantly demanding more of science to give us the answers but when you look at the the universe we can learn so much about how old it is and, and how it came into existence and and how uh, all the elements uh, in our lives came into existence and how the biology has occurred and but there comes a point at which we don't really understand that that system of of, of how perhaps humans and how consciousness is different to other animals that we suspect don't have consciousness. They're just going on a hardwired biological program. And that's really fascinating when yeah. you start to think, okay, at what part does a, a brain develop consciousness? And what does consciousness mean? What does what, what is this self-awareness? 
whatever it means, it, it's incredibly significant because to have um, the, the the from a physics point of view, just to have particles, you know, quarks and electrons that are just subatomic particles, to be able to reassemble themselves into a, a, an organism that can start having self-awareness, that can build spaceships, that can send humans off and, and to look down on, on life and, and start questioning the existence of what is just a subatomic particle. This is incredible. And, and this is where, of course, that forms the basis of, 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 of many religions, of faith, yeah. because that's the step at which a lot of people will say, well... This is the creator. This is this is all being uh, you know designed uh, the universe. Um, I approach it from a more scientific point of view, but I I like to keep all options open. I like to keep an open mind about everything. Is that one of the biggest things that you think has changed in yourself since going to space? Um, I think it's it's reinforced uh, something that I firmly believed in before I went to space. But yes, it, it really has. Um, it opens your mind to so many possibilities, and 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 it really it just it fuels the fire yeah. within me, if you like. The fuel fuels the fire of curiosity, uh, and I just think that the more we learn about this, it's absolutely fascinating. The more we learn about the universe, is fascinating as to how it operates and how it works. Yeah. Um, uh, at the very macroscopic, yeah. sorry, microscopic level to the macroscopic level. Would you go up again? Definitely. <laughs> Would you? No doubt at all. <laughs> no doubt at all. Um, I think what's happening at the moment is so exciting. Um, we have got a number of missions that are going back to the moon over the next few years. First one coming off very soon, Artemis 1. Uh, it's going to be so exciting. I, and I think that uh, a lot of, uh, of the public are starting to realise now that, that what's about to happen, but it's, it's been, it hasn't been mainstream news. So for, for many people, it'll be quite a surprise to learn that in the next couple of years, we're going to have humans walking on the surface of the moon again. That was such a, a monumental moment, of course, back in the 60s because it, they were the first missions to the moon. But but for so many generations who haven't been alive to witness that, it is going to be yeah. a, a, you know, the second moonshot that we can all uh, you know witness and, and enjoy. And this is for a permanent presence. We're going to set up habitation modules there, a stepping stone to Mars, and it's all happening very soon. <sighs> Humans say. Humans, what they can do. <laughs> Tim, look, I, I can't thank you enough for stopping by during a busy tour, what you have done is incredible. The way you talk about it, the way you share your knowledge, your wisdom, it's really inspiring. I'm truly grateful I had the opportunity to talk to you today. This podcast is called Feel Better, Live More. When we feel better in ourselves, we get more out of our lives. I just wonder, right at the end of our conversation, for my audience, for people who listen regularly, who are inspired by what you've had to say, who might be struggling in their lives with the pressures and stresses of day-to-day, -day, regular planet Earth living. Do you have any final words? Uh, um, try and just take some time for yourself every day. Just a few moments in a quiet place if you can connect with nature. Just remember, you know, who we are, why we're here. Um, I think it's just about trying to find happiness within yourself. Um, when that comes down to having time for yourself. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Great talking to you. If that conversation resonated with you, I think you are really going to enjoy this one about how you can create healthy habits that last. Your current life today is largely the sum of your habits. It's the habits that you've been following for, say, the last six months or the last year or the last two years that have carried you to whatever results you have right now. But I think the real reason that habits matter is 